Show! Today we bring to you the French-infused rock of Remy de la Roque and the fifth juggernaut of the independent film industry, Elias! Then we present the hip-hop spoken word of Kamal Amani, but first witness the photographic work of the one and only Melanie Shatsky. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show! So my name is Melanie Shatsky. I make photographs. Well, I've been making photographs for about um, 10 years now, maybe a little bit more. And um, I would say that my grandmother had a large part to do with my attraction to photographs. She um, would have boxes and boxes of um, photographs of her family and her surroundings. And I would regularly pour over these images and try and understand these clues as to who I was. Um, so my attraction to photo was to become a kind of maker of clues. I'm also drawn to photography because it has a certain relationship to reality that is arguably unparalleled within the visual arts. Um, and this, this relationship to reality enables the maker of the photographs to create an intricate fiction. There's something really kind of odd about those trees in how kind of perfect and imperfect they are at the same time. That image really feels like a facade. I don't know, this to me is an interesting image just because it seems strange that a trampoline, which is kind of a symbol of freedom, should be shoved in between these two buildings and that it's inaccessible, there's that inaccessibility because of that, um, of, of the fence there. Um, I would say that I'm inspired by discomfort. Um, I often put myself in kind of uncomfortable or questionable situations just to see how I react or interact with the situation at hand. And um, this is something that I explore a lot within my work. I will um, use models and put them in kind of que questionable situations. Um, and this, I don't know, also kind of creates a, an uncomfortable situation for the viewer. So it's, it's that discomfort that, that I, I don't know, that I, that I really take well to, that I'm very interested in on my own part and on the part of someone who is engaging with my art. kind of a bird cage. It's a strange bird cage that, I don't know, that also to me kind of implies that a kind of pulse of something needing to be released. I think an artist is considered a professional when he or she is self-motivated and doesn't need due dates or deadlines to make work. And he can just, or she can just do it on her own and is self-assured enough in, in what he or she is doing to just make the work. I think my work is perceived as disquieting. I think some people get it and some people don't. So this is my most recent work, it's still a work in progress, and I wanted to do a project about a breaking down of communication or a closing up of the senses. So I sought out a man who'd lost an eye and a woman whose ear had never fully developed. I wanted these images to be um, really quite bland and plain and almost boring in a way, and that for the drama to reside really in that one thing that was missing or 
um, not fully developed. Um, so even though each of these images is really um, independent, there's still a kind of dialogue that goes on between this man and this woman. the images to be quite static in a way, which is where I brought in the worms. The worms for me imply, they're, they're kind of a, a look on the inside, um, and I, I feel that there's a like an implied kind of energy that works with these more kind of still static images. Thank you for watching the program. If you want to see more of my stuff, you can go to my website, which is at www melanieshatsky.com that's m-e-l-a-n-i-e s-h-a-t-z-k-y dot com thanks and you say New York City welcome to Kamal Amani my world all right? I'm a spoken word artist, actor, and model. And I hope that y'all see me real soon on a stage near you blazing it up. All right? Out. What I'm very interested in is seeing people rise spiritually and people getting above the um, ideas that the matrix imposes upon us, such as racism, sexism, classism, materialism, you know, all these things that make us think if we don't have this, then we're nobody because we're all somebody within, you know, and I'm always striving to identify my purpose and trying to refine it, refine my ideas. And when I speak to other people, I'm speaking to myself too. Like I have a poem called Your Armchair Revolutionary, right? I'm also talking about myself in certain instances because some things I say, yeah, I'm going to go down to that rally or I'm going to go do this or I'm going to do that. And that day comes and I don't feel like doing it, you know, so I have to analyze myself, but at the same time, I want to make other people look at themselves, man in the mirror type of situation. You are armchair revolutionary. You are armchair revolutionary. Yo, you talk a good one every time I come through, but the real question is what you going to do? You are armchair revolutionary. You are coffee you ain't never been to Africa, uh, Double Muslim and never been to Mecca. Uh, disciple the king and never waged a boycott. Never went to a rally when one of our folks got shot by the cops. Never told a young cat to stop selling rocks. You just blah, blah, blah. Talk about everything under the sun, moon, and stars. Grew some dreads and talk about job. Shaved your head and talk about our life. Got hit with some curveballs in life and turned to Christ. Went Pentecostal and started talking voodoo. You too through. Yo, you talk a good one every time I come through. But the real question is, what you going to do? You are armchair revolutionary. I'm very passionate about just making people see the need to rise and not let the government and, and other situations, miseducational system and things like that, just keep them down, you know, um, because all of us can participate in making this world a better place. You know, and that's really what I'm all about. You know, while I'm here, I want to make a difference before I'm out. I write a lot of things, and I just love to go in front of people. It's, it's a big challenge. I love to see people smile, you know. I love, I love when people come up to me and I've really made their day, you know, or I really made them think about something they would have never thought about. You know, so I can write something and leave it at home and shove it in the drawer, but certain things I know will just help that person's life. What happens is, for a while you can run around and be treated like a uh, starving artist, but there always comes a point when you say, you know what, I have a following, I have a fan base, you know, and I paid my dues, so I'm not going to pay you so much to get on the stage or to get on TV or to get on the radio. You know, because I already have a following and I know I'm good now. You know, there's a time when you start crawling and you say, okay, you know, I'll give you this amount of money or that amount of money, you know, so I can get that exposure. But then there comes a time you say, you know what? I may bring 100 people to your club tonight. You know, and if all those 100 people are paying you $10, I'm not getting nothing, plus I'm paying you. 
So you start to realize that I'm good, you know? You know, I'm a professional now. And, and you know, you really can't compromise that too much for anybody. War no more. We're in a state of emergency. Move with urgency for power. Because we can't allow a microscopic percent of the government to monkey wrench and disease the environment with age, racism, neo-Nazism, Afro-Saxon, puppetism. Because planet Earth is bleeding and we're needing a first aid kit to put an end to this shh. War no more. War no more. We're in a state of emergency, move with urgency for power. This is the final hour, people got to understand. We've been catching hell since we fell in this land. So I ran to Iraq to attack the Arab that grabbed his brother's oil and found myself in turmoil on holy soil. Mecca, Medina, the so-called Middle East, fighting for the rich American beast. In the name of peace, they claim war as a solution. While back home, I should be fighting my own revolution. Down with apartheid internationally. We're in a state of emergency. That just came out, man. <laughs> Yo, thank you very much for watching the show, checking me out, you know, and hopefully you see me soon blazing a mic near you. And for more information about me, you can just go on Yahoo or Google, put in Kamal Imani, or put in Kamal in spoken word, and you're going to get a whole bunch of options where you can check me out, all right? Or you can email me at cyphercam at yahoo.com. That's C-I-P-H-E-R-K-A-M at yahoo.com, all right? And uh, once again, thanks, God bless. Keep doing your thing, live your dream, keep your head up. Don't let nothing or nobody keep you down, all right? Peace. I'm Elias. I'm 29 years old. Um, I have a lot of student loan debt, like many other people, and what I really do for a living for money means very little to me. It's about as inspiring to me as, I don't know, a badly labeled jar of tomato sauce. In any case, I make movies. Uh, I write them, I act in them, I produce them, direct them, cut them, sound design for them. I pretty much do everything you can do uh, for movies. <laughs> and when I was 15, I started taking acting classes, and I wrote my own stuff. I improv a lot of stuff, and it was a lot of fun. So I started auditioning for community theater, and in this community theater, these community theater productions, did all, I did any, anything and everything. I would do whatever the heck they wanted me to do, because I just wanted to be on stage. I just wanted to be acting. The transition from, from being an actor to making the movies, as well as acting in them, is kind of like this. Hmm. It just seems so much easier to to be in your own movie. Oh. I'm trying to finish the monologue here. This is my monologue and this is my show. I am the star. I would oh. like to finish the monologue, please. Can you please just let me finish the oh. monologue? Oh. Who do you think you are? Oh. I don't know you. Where do you come from? I've never seen oh. you before in my life. Can I please oh. just finish the oh. monologue? Thank you. Now put your oh. head out of the frame. Down. I like to write. And I had this kind of creative writing that I was nurturing. And I, I wanted, I thought, well, why not? Kill two birds with one stone. You know what? I can I can write roles for myself and for my friends and for other people I know, or, and I can make the movies myself and basically be master of my domain. So that's kind of how that happened. And when I was 19 years old, um, uh, I was working in a movie theater in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and we made uh, my first short film, which is um, called A Walk in the Park. <laughs> A guy gets attacked while taking a walk uh, in the park and at night. You know, obviously, he's not the smartest fellow. And he gets attacked by some kind of like creature. Some. It was supposed to be kind of like a werewolf, but I didn't have any money. So it became more like the creature you don't see because you don't have the money to actually make it. His ear gets completely sliced off his head by the, the creature, and then the creature just obviously disappears, and he's left alone 
on the ground, bleeding. If you dig it, you dig it, and that's cool. And I, I, I hope you do. But I make it, for me, I guess first and foremost, with the hope that I can entertain and affect and get reactions from other people, uh, because I think it's fun to do that kind of stuff. What's great is when you've let it go, when you've, you've let the project go, and you've let everyone's input, the various friends and collaborators you have, go into that project and, and become what it is, uh, and it's out there on the screen or on the stage, wherever it might be, and people are laughing or crying or cursing it or saying, oh my God, what is this horrible atrocity, which has been the case on, actually in some of my movies. But that was fun. You know? That is a great experience when people react. The reaction is just, it's awesome. I'm never going to stop making movies. I'm never going to, to, to not write and, and, and make films uh, because I can't afford to rent a 35 millimeter camera or an HD camera because you know what? Um, you gotta express yourself. My latest movie is a short film um, called Love Cracked. Uh, it's a bio slash spoof of um, H.P. Lovecraft, the horror author. And if you're out there wondering well, who's H.P. Lovecraft? The name kind of sounds familiar, but I don't really know. Well, that's exactly one of the reasons why I made the movie. Lovecraft was born in Providence, Rhode Island on August 20th, 1890. This is not his home. It's a movie about a guy that people don't know, know of too well, unless you're you know, really into horror or horror literature, and how no one knows who this guy is, and how we as filmmakers don't know. Now let's get some opinions from the street. For I, once again, have cast myself in this film, and I am the, the documentarian who's uh, <laughs> a little full of himself and doesn't seem to know much about his subject. Do you think Lovecraft might have ever tried on women's clothes? If so, what kind of clothes and how often? The Lovecraft and his women clothes inspires very much the uh, story of uh, Terra Firmer because it's uh, sexual confusion and, and sugar cookies naturally has many lesbians in it. I hope you enjoyed what you saw. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about Biff Juggernaut Productions, go right here because you can find out all you need to know. Hi, my name is Remy. I'm from France and I live in New York now. And I love New York, I love the New York scene. I play acoustic rock. Check out my music. Carol's on my mind. Uh, hell is gone, I feel so fine. Carol's on my mind. talk about that song carols on my mind because it's a song i wrote after september 11 and uh, i have a little girl i mean she doesn't live with me she's in north carolina and she used to live in new york and um her school is right a few three or four blocks from the world trade center and i was dropping her at school at 8 45 when the towers started exploding it's the song is about that it started there. You don't know when you're actually living, what's happening, uh, but you know where the song comes from. And it was there, the spirit was there. It was a mess, everything was exploding, and I took my daughter and we walked out. It was like an exodus of people, people screaming and shouting and everything. And my daughter, she had her girlfriend. 
She's seven years old at the time. And she has a girlfriend. They're holding hands. And it's, it's a catastrophe in the background. And they're talking to each other like nothing is happening. They're smiling and they're playing games. And you have no idea what a mess it was around them. But for me, just to see that, it just comforted me. It just made me feel like everything was going to be all right. And I could just focus on the beauty of those two little girls. And that's what this song is about. Carol's on my mind. Carol, that's my daughter's doll. And if you listen to the lyrics, they don't really relate the whole event. Just a little bit, some phrases here and there. But it's a beautiful song that started there, September 11. I always feel like uh, if you feel successful, you're successful. I mean, it's not something that, um, that comes naturally, because I think that everybody has an expectation of being famous, and everybody wants to be recognized and known and you know, have everybody love their music and love them. If you know that you're talented and what you do has an impact on people, I think you're already successful. I want to play this song for you. Um, it's a song I wrote during the blackout where there was no electricity and I was sitting at my desk and I was thinking, I didn't know what to do. And I thought, well, I might as well, might as well just write a song. So, uh, and this came up and it's called Kissing. just a segment of my music, uh, one of my songs, uh, but uh, if you want to check my website, uh, you can find show dates, and you can also uh, find my CD. It's available on there at uh, remydelarocque.com, R-E-M-Y-D-E-L-A-R-O-Q-U-E. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Thanks to all the artists and all the people that made this show possible. Special thanks to New York City for providing a breeding ground of creativity. It's art. Or something like it's art. Or something like it. This is Art or Something Like It. Presenting a gallery of amazing artists each and every week and more integrity than he can shake a stick at. For more information about the show or any of the artists on the show, please visit artorsomethinglikeit.com. Next time you experience something new and you don't know what to make of it, you should ask yourself, is it art or something like it? Thank you. Good night. I'm
Martyr, Martyr.